Hello and welcome to the Special Senses. So this is the continuation of our lecture, uh, breaking it up into a few pieces to make life easier for all of us. So Special Senses. When we talk about Special Senses, what we're talking about here are confined to the head, vision, hearing, smell, taste. These are Special Senses. Alright, uh, first things first, we're going to start with the eyes, obviously. So you can't uh, not have my little girl's big blues here. So um, what I want to point out is that the eye has a white part, so around the uh, the iris of the eye, the iris here seen in blue, and then a pupil in the middle. White part, part with coloration, part that's completely dark. Now the reasoning for this is quite simplistic. Uh, the white part on the outside is no different from a tendon. It's just fibrous connective tissue. The iris here, shown in blue, oh my girl, uh, is muscular, and we'll talk about that here in just a second. And then the central pupil, which is completely dark, is not itself dark. The pupil is, quite frankly, a hole in the eye. It's an opening through which light passes. And everything behind it is non-reflective. So the whole back surface of the eye is non-reflective, which is why your pupils appear quite dark. The only time the pupils will ever appear with any coloration is like if, you, um, if it's dark and you take flash photography and you get what they call red eye, that's light reflecting off the blood in the back of the eye that's... Um, nourishing the neural receptors that are in there in essence. So that's red eye. So again, white part uh, around the outside, this blue here, which is the iris, would have coloration, and then you have this very dark pupil. All right, let's talk about the layerings. So the eye has a, a lot of different layers to it. The first that we'll talk about is the fibrous layer. The fibrous layer is made up of the sclera and the cornea. Both of these are quite important, but for very, very different reasons. Uh, the sclera. The sclera is the white part of the eye that we've been talking about, alright? It's this white part on the round, outside all of this, this white part, that is all sclera. To sclerize means to toughen or harden, alright? So this white part of the eye, it's basically the same substance as a tendon or a ligament, it's just a bunch of collagen fiber. And uh, what it does is, it's very, very thick, very, very strong, it helps to maintain the shape of the eye overall. Uh, it's like you can push against the eye and kind of feel the toughness of it. If you take um, scissors and try to cut through the sclera of an eyeball, it feels like you're cutting like a tin can. It's very thick, very strong. The sclera of the eye is very, very tough, very strong. It's where the muscles attach, white part of the eye. The cornea is entirely different from this. It's so thin that it's completely transparent. The way the fibrous network itself lays, uh, the way the fibers are laid down, leads it to be transparent. The cornea of the eye is this clear part along the outside, which is completely clear, completely transparent, and uh, basically is where your contact lens would sit if you wear contact lenses. So it shields this entire frontal portion of the eye, and it looks something like this, okay? Now, this is incredibly important. The sclera, no, 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 wrong, I'm sorry. The cornea, the cornea of the eye is the primary light-bending apparatus for vision. When you look at things and your eyes bend light to focus it on the back of your eye, it's the cornea. All right, the cornea does the job. Now you also have a lens within the eye, which we'll be talking about here at the end, uh, but the lens quite simply just, just fine tunes the image. It does nothing special. It just kind of tunes the image a little bit so that you can see it a little more clearly. The cornea is the primary light bending apparatus, what we call the refractory process. It's the primary structure for refraction. All right. Next, vascular layer. Vascular means it has blood flow, okay? And uh, what parts of the eye have blood flow? The choroid has blood flow, the ciliary body has blood flow, and the iris has blood flow. And this is for very simple reasons. The choroid of the eye is the next layer in from the sclera. So if this is the front of the eye and this is the back of the eye, and here's the optic nerve, the next layer in from the sclera along the back of the eye would be the choroid. Choroid is uh, heavily pigmented along the back of the eye with melanin and um, this gives the back of the eye a very non-reflective surface. This is why the pupil appears dark, is because when light comes in it never comes back out. Because all the melanin in the choroid stops the light, it absorbs it. Okay, And uh, the choroid basically contains all the, the uh, blood necessary to provide nutrition for your optic receptors. So you have these optic receptors called the rods and cones. They're part of the retina, uh, which is here. Okay, the retina. Parts of the retina are called the rods and cones. And these rods and cones bury themselves into the choroid so that they can get appropriate amounts of nutrition. 
Uh, next, we have the ciliary body and the iris. So the ciliary body and the iris are both muscle, and being that they are both muscle, they obviously get a lot of blood flow. So the ciliary body is the structure which houses the lens of the eye. You can see this here. Here's the lens. The ciliary body would be like a circle around the lens, attaching to it with tiny little ligaments so that it can stretch the eye, or I'm sorry, stretch the lens or squeeze the lens depending upon what is necessary. So the ciliary body is muscular. And then the iris. The iris of the eye, again, as shown here, is muscular and uh, it has the capacity to close the pupil or open the pupil, depending upon how close something is to you or how far away it is, and also upon the amount of light in an area that you are um, viewing. So if you're a very bright light and you go to a dim room, it, it seems very dark at first because your pupils have to dilate, they have to open up. And by comparison, if you're in a very dim situation and you walk out in the bright sunlight, your eyes hurt. Oh, it takes a little bit of time for your eyes to adapt. What happens is the pupils have to constrict. That's done by the iris, which is muscular, which means that it has to have uh, blood flow to it. Then there is the inner layer of the eye. This would be the retina. Uh, the retina shown here in yellow. Uh, the retina contains the rods and cones of the eye, which allow you to perceive light. Okay, the rods and cones are your visual receptors. They are what we call your visual transducers. That's a very important word you should know. Transduction means to convert a signal from one form to another. And what your rods and cones do in your eye is they convert light into action potentials. Now, in the retina, there are several spots that you need to be very familiar with. Uh, and these are the blind spot, the macula lutea, and the fovea centralis. Blind spot, macula lutea, fovea centralis. You will be hearing these terms again. The blind spot is oftentimes coined as your optic disc, and it's back here on the back of the eye. It's where the optic nerve connects. Uh, the long and the short of this is that your optic disc or your blind spot, it has no rods, no cones, no visual receptors of any kind. Basically because of the way the eye structures itself, there's no room for them because the optic nerve connects here. Now, you cannot perceive light that hits this structure. You can go online and you can do a blind spot test and you can see that your blind spot exists. Um, but what your brain does is a process that's referred to as filling in, and it will fill in what it thinks should be in that area with um, random images in essence. So if I'm looking at a screen and it's all white, then it'll put a white dot in my blind spot. If I'm looking at a green field, it'll put a green dot in my blind spot, so I never mentally notice it, but it's there. It's a weird thing. Uh, and again, you can test for this. Pause this video, go online and type in blind spot test, and you will see this. And then we have the macula lutea and the fovea centralis. Okay, so let me describe these to you. The fovea centralis is the most important amongst these. The fovea centralis is the central focus. Fovea centralis, central focus. When light comes in and it's bent by the um, cornea, it's finely tuned by the uh, lens and it's put like a laser beam right onto the fovea centralis. The fovea centralis is about the size of the end of a ballpoint pen and it contains about half of the neural receptors within the eye. In other words, they are just packed into there, man. Just packed in and almost entirely made up of cone photoreceptors. Uh, the cone photoreceptors are what give you your sharpest bright light um, color vision. Your color vision, your sharp vision, it's all cones and it's almost entirely focused on the fovea centralis, this tiny little dot. In fact, you can see it right here in this image. There's a fovea centralis, right in the middle, a little bitty dot. And this kind of dark area around it, like a little donut, that is the macula lutea. The macula lutea is a swelling of blood vessels that nourishes the fovea centralis and keeps it functional. The fovea centralis is very metabolically active, so in order to stay working for the fovea centralis to have enough nutrient supply to stay functional, it has to have uh, this, this macula lutea built up around it to provide it with the nutrition that's necessary. All right, inside the eye there are two chambers, an anterior chamber in front of the lens and a posterior chamber behind the lens. Quite simplistically, uh, the anterior chamber is full of a fluid called aqueous humor. It's constantly being produced and it puts pressure against the cornea. Basically makes the cornea like a little balloon um, and helps it keep its shape, which is very important. If you've ever heard of glaucoma, these are uh, variations in pressure against this uh, structure from the production of aqueous humor. Vitreous humor is very old and it's non-renewing. Vitreous humor is found behind the lens and it's back here. This is like a, a thick gel that sort of helps to support the eye and keep it in its appropriate shape. 
You may have heard the term floaters before. That's buildup in the vitreous humor. So you can get stuff in there that never leaves because the vitreous humor is non-renewing. And then last but not least is the lens. And the only thing I really want to say about the lens is that it fine-tunes vision. The primary refractory process is done by the cornea. The lens just kind of tunes the image a little bit. And it's capable of moving, so it can be stretched or made more flat. All right, let's talk a little bit about the photoreceptors, of which there are two forms, the rods and the cones. So you have a lot of photoreceptors. Most of the um, peripheral receptors of the body are photoreceptors. They're just packed into the eye, massive in number, and uh, they are, in fact, rods and cones. So what will happen is light comes into the eye, light passes through ganglia cells, through bipolar neurons, through the nuclei of the rods and cones before initially hitting the photoreceptive portions of the rods and cones, which are then embedded in the choroid, which is quite dark because of all that melanin. Okay, so light has to go through a lot of stuff before it gets to the rods and cones. Through a lot of stuff before it gets to the rods and cones, except at the fovea centralis where most of the excess material is pushed to the side so that your vision is a little sharper. That's why it gets this little light dot right there. All right, so rods deal with contrast. Rods deal with when it's dark. Rods deal with what we consider um, uh, almost black and white vision. Rods are on what's called a converging neural path, a converging path. Uh, and the essence of this is that many rods connect to a single ganglia, which sends a message to the brain, which gives you really pixelated, is the way I think about it, uh, you'd call it low-def, low-quality vision. The concept of rods is that when it's freaking dark outside, you can still see a little bit. And that's because your rods are active. Mostly in your peripheral vision, but your rods are active. The cones have to have a lot of light to function. The cones have an uh, individual neural path. That means that every cone receptor connects to its own ganglia that sends its own unique message to the brain. Side effect of this is that the vision provided by the cones is very high quality. Uh, gives you this, this amazing detail, these, these beautiful colors. Uh, we think that animals, for instance, like your dog, see in black and white because they have mostly rod-based receptors, if not entirely rod-based receptors. So their vision is really dull and blurry, whereas your vision is very bright, uh, good color, very sharp. Your vision is pretty unique. Uh, only some of the other upper primates have this capacity. Most other animals have uh, vision set up for night vision. Yeah. Yeah, I think that'll do. So, again, rods, black and white vision, uh, good for night vision, converging neural path, which means they have low resolution imaging. Uh, cones, good for bright light. Excellent for picking up color variations. They're on an individual neural path, which means that one receptor sends its own unique message to the brain, which gives you very high resolution. Okay, I'm pretty happy with that. Now keep in mind, again, just to state this, that both rods and cones are embedded in the choroid at the end of the day, uh, because the choroid provides them with the nutrition they need to survive. So you've got ganglia, bipolar neurons, rods and cones, choroid. You'll be doing this on your lab test, so you need to be familiar. And maybe even your lecture test, for that matter. Um, so here we have the optic disc, the fovea centralis, and the macular lutea, which is very pretty. I will mention macular degeneration here. All right, there is a uh, medical condition called macular degeneration, where the macula lutea breaks down. And if the macula lutea quits working, the fovea centralis, all the nerves there die. And you end up with a hole in your vision, not unlike the images that you're seeing here. Uh, one of the reasons that it's recommended that you go to an uh, eye doctor every year or two is to make sure that you're not ending up with macular degeneration. Because we can do something about it if we catch it early. But if you don't catch it early and the nerves die, they're never coming back. It's like the central nervous system. Blind spot test. If I sit at this distance and I close my left eye and I look at the plus sign, the blue dot disappears. Alright? That's because when light's coming in, the light from the blue dot is reflected onto the optic disc, which is a blind spot, and there are no rods and cones there, ergo I cannot perceive them. Okay, so that is a blind spot test. You can take a sheet of paper, put a plus on one side and a dot on the other, and um, can I close one eye and look at the dots and the pluses, and you'll see that one of them will disappear, just because it focuses light on the optic disc, which is kind of cool. 
All right, vision accessory structures. So about 70% of buyer receptors, yeah, yeah, most of the receptors of the body are in the eyes, that's a fact. Uh, you have eyebrows and eyelids. So the reason you have eyebrows is not for style points. Uh, you have eyebrows for a very specific purpose. They tend to funnel sweat away from your eyes whenever you're sweating heavily. So imagine if you're trying to chase down an animal to stab it and carry food home for the family. You better be able to see, so you have eyebrows. Uh, you have eyelashes to protect the eyes. Your eyelashes are long and they stick out because uh, they, they are, are very sensitive to touch. Okay, They are highly innervated, so if anything foreign touches them, that sends off a, um, a uh, what do you call it, reflex arc, a reflex arc that automatically closes the eyes to help to keep them protected. What else do we have here? Conjunctiva, yeah, so the conjunctiva is a mucosal sac that lines the eye. You may have heard of conjunctivitis, that's an inflammation, pink eye, right? Uh, the conjunctiva basically seals the eyeball against the eyelids and eyelashes uh, so that nothing can get in behind the eye and cause problems. You have the extrinsic eye muscles, of which there are six. Imagine what the eye can do, right? There is a superior rectus, makes the eye look up. Inferior rectus, makes the eye look down. Lateral rectus, makes the eye look left. Medial rectus, makes the eye look right, uh, depending upon which eye, obviously. And then you have two uh, obliques, a superior oblique and an inferior oblique. And basically what they can do is kind of twist the eye a little bit to help you tune the image. Uh, so you have six extrinsic eye muscles. And then, of course, there is the lacrimal apparatus. Um, I really like the lacrimal apparatus. You need to become friends with this, okay? You have the lacrimal gland above the eye on its lateral aspect. It drops fluid into the eye, and every time you blink, like this eyeball here, it, it doesn't just close like this. It would close like that, okay? It funnels this fluid across the eye towards here, and you know that because if you ever get anything in your eyes, you kind of wipe the area by your nose, and you get that stuff out. Okay, it funnels everything towards the middle, and the idea is that any debris will collect here in the center, and then above and below that are these lacrimal punctums. Okay, the lacrimal punctums are these little bitty holes. I invite you to pause this video, go find a mirror, pull your eyelid down, and you'll see that there are tiny little holes in the top and bottom lid. And what will happen is that fluid from the lacrimal gland is funneled across the eye, and every time you blink, it's pushed into these lacrimal punctums. That fluid then runs into these lacrimal canaliculi, into a lacrimal sac, down what's called a nasolacrimal duct, nasolacrimal. It goes down into the nose, and the idea is that it runs down the back of your throat, and you never know it happened. Uh, that's why if you ever have to use eye drops or something along those lines, you can kind of taste the eye drop sometimes. It's because that fluid is running down the back of your throat. I can smell it, like, I can smell it sometimes. It's because it's running through the nose. And... There may come a time when you've got a little head cold, and you'll be sitting there doing whatever it is that you do, and then you turn or you move in a different way, and fluid just runs out of the nose. That's because you'll get a blockage in your sinuses, and the fluid from your lacrimal glands just builds up in the nose in like a big pool. And then when you move your head a different way, it just runs out like a hose, man. This just flows on out of there. Uh, that's because, again, this fluid runs into the nose and then down the back of the throat. Now, the tears themselves are very important. They contain a chemical called lysozyme, and lysozyme is a really nice antibacterial uh, compound so that you can protect your eyes and decrease your risk of getting an infection. Uh, further, in the eyes, we have a, um, well... Let's not worry about the rest of that. So I will say that you blink reflexively about every three to seven seconds. Like if you sit there trying to just hold your eyes open, eventually you will blink. It's hard to, to prevent your brain from forcing it upon you because the eyes don't do well when they're dry. Image formation depends upon fraction by the cornea. Uh, take home message here is that the cornea does the primary, draw, uh, primary job of uh, bending light for vision. Now, not every eye is perfect in the way that it focuses light. The idea is a nice emetropic, emetropic eye would focus light primarily with the retina, fine-tune it with the lens, and focus it like a laser beam on the fovea centralis. But that's not always the case, now is it? Some of us are nearsighted, that will be myopic, and some of us are farsighted, though far less, uh, and that would be hyperopic. A myopic eye, someone who is nearsighted, the eye is quite simply too long. If the eye is too long, uh, the image gets focused, and then by the time it reaches the fovea centralis, it's back out of focus. So you don't have good vision. So what you have to do is wear a lens on the outer surface that will change the way light focuses onto the fovea centralis, or alternatively have surgery where they augment the shape of the cornea 
to focus light on the fovea centralis. That's what uh, laser eye surgery is, LASIK. That is augmenting the shape of the cornea. And again, it's the same thing with hyperopia. A hyperopic eye is too short, so the light is not fully focused by the time it reaches the fovea centralis. It's out of focus. So this is a person that can see far away but not close up. A myopic person can see close up but not far away. And then we have the near response. So this is augmentations to the eyes when you look at something far away versus close up. It's just a really good way to describe kind of how the eye works and how it does what it does. The first thing to talk about here is the concept of convergence. There are three that we're going to do, but convergence is first. And the, the concept is that when you look at something very far away, like here we have an open field, the eyes are virtually parallel. So the, the field of vision is quite overlapping, very parallel. Uh, and this allows you to perceive depth in what you see in front of you. By comparison, as you begin to look at something closer up, the eyes begin to converge. And as they converge, your brain can interpret that level of convergence and help you to grasp how far away things are. Um, this is, again, depth perception. This is how we judge depth perception. And this is also why your eyes will hurt if you try to read for a long period of time. By converging these eyes, you're flexing your uh, um, lateral, no, I'm sorry, your medial rectus muscles, and these are, are just muscles. So if you keep them flexed for an hour, they're going to begin to hurt. They're, they're going to begin to fatigue, and uh, this is one of the reasons that our eyes will hurt if we try to read for a long time. Then there's pupillary constriction. The concept is if you look at something very far away, the pupils tend to dilate, all right? And if you look at something very close up, the pupils tend to constrict. Um, what this does is it varies the, the angles that light comes into the eyes. Light from something far away tends to be quite parallel. The, um, the, the light itself in its wavelengths tend to be very parallel, uh, whereas light that comes in from something very close to you tends to come in at very disparate angles. So you have to limit those angles so that your vision can be sharper. How do you limit the angles? By constricting the pupil down. And you know this, if you've ever gone to an eye doctor and had your eyes dilated, after your eyes are dilated and they cannot physically constrict, you'll notice that you can't see things close up anymore. The funniest thing, you know, you go to the eye doctor and then they ask you to sign something afterwards. You can't even see it. I remember having to ask a lady one time, I was like, can you just put my hand where I'm supposed to sign my name and then I'll, you know, do the muscle memory. And that's the only way I could do it because everything's so blurry up close because my eyes were permanently dilated. All right, and, or semi-permanently, I guess. And then, of course, there is accommodation of the lens. So when you look at something very far away, the ciliary body stretches the lens and pulls it more flat. Uh, when you look at something close up, near vision, the lens, uh, I'm sorry, the um, ciliary body squeezes the lens and makes the lens more round, basically just fine-tuning the image. So stretching the lens versus squeezing the lens, you need to know which is which, dependent upon distance versus close up. Again. Uh, this is looking at something far away. This is looking at something close up. And what you'll notice is that as we age, uh, we tend to need reading glasses. And the reason that we need reading glasses is quite simple. Um, the, problem, the process of accommodation of the lens becomes more difficult because the lens hardens as we age. So when you're in your 40s and 50s, the lens will get so tough that it can't be squeezed as much as it needs to be squeezed. So you will no longer have good close-up vision when you need reading glasses. And then we have stereoscopic vision. Eh. Basically, this is just relating the concept of depth perception and how our eyes function. I'm not that concerned about it, to be honest, at this particular stage. I will, however, talk about the neurons. So we had talked previously about bipolar neurons and anexonic neurons. We talked about all these, but in particular, bipolar neurons we said were found in the visual processing centers, as well as anexonic neurons being found in the visual process. I said we'd talk about these more later. Well, welcome to later. Uh, in the eye, light comes through from here up and then down through the ganglia, through what are called amacrine and horizontal cells, through the bipolar neurons, through the nuclei of the photoreceptors until they physically, the light physically strikes the receptive portions of the photoreceptors and allows you to perceive that light. Uh, the only thing I really want to point out, I'm not going to go into the crazy detail here, for obvious reasons. The only thing I want to point out is that these, this amacrine cell, horizontal cell, these are uh, anexonic neurons. And by being anexonic, they lack axons, all they have is dendrites. Uh, what they can do is they take up excess neurotransmitter to tune the amount of neurotransmitter being released between the photoreceptors, the bipolar neurons, and the ganglion cells. 
The concept is the photoreceptors stimulate the bipolar neurons, which in turn stimulate the ganglia, and then the ganglion cells send messages to the uh, central nervous system for interpretation. So there's a lot of in-between here, and the uh, amacrine cells, horizontal cells, these anaxonic neurons, tune the conversation being had here so that the ganglia get as precise a signal as possible. Yes, that's perfect. All right, we do need to talk about rhodopsin. So what we have here is a conversation on retinol and opsin. Retinol and opsin. Um, what do we want to say? Okay, um, in your visual receptors, in your rods and cones, these are built up of tiny little discs. And you can see these here. You can see these here. Little stacks of discs. If you think back to your biology one and you remember thylakoids and their little discs and stacks called grana, this is very similar. It's just how visual or light absorbing pigmentation structures are built. They are built in these little discs. This, 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 you can see them. Now on these discs, in your rods and cones, what you have is a membrane, and that membrane is just studded with proteins called opsin proteins. Okay, studded with opsin proteins. Those opsin proteins in the dark, this is important, in the dark, are all saturated with what's called cis-retinol. It's called cis-retinol. There's a, there are two forms of retinol. There's cis-retinol and trans-retinol. Cis-retinol has a bent tail. Trans-retinol has a straight tail. This is dealing with what's called conformations. So there are cis molecules and trans molecules. You can turn these um, double bonds in a lot of cases. Uh, cis-retinol is found on opsin in the dark. Let me say that one more time. If you are asleep and it's completely dark in your room, all your discs and your rods and cones, they are all going to contain a lot of opsin proteins. And those opsin proteins are just filled with cis-retinol at rest, in the dark. Cis-retinol. Now, how do you signal your brain that you see something? Well, the answer here is kind of neat. When light enters your eyes and it goes through the ganglia, through the bipolar neurons, through the nuclei, the uh, rods and cones, eventually striking the visual perceptive portions of the rods and cones, what will happen is a process called bleaching. All right, The cis-retinol is bleached. We call that bleaching. It's bleached into trans-retinol, and trans-retinol gets kicked out of opsin. Now, there's a term here that we need to use, and that term is rhodopsin. Rhodopsin is opsin bound to cis-retinol. Let me say that one more time. Rhodopsin is a term we use to describe opsin bound to cis-retinol. When light comes in and it hits cis-retinol, it bleaches rhodopsin and turns that cis-retinol into trans-retinol and kicks it out of the opsin protein. This sets off a chain of reactions which leads to uh, the ganglion cells of the rods and cones sending messages to the brain that you see things. The reason we're capable of seeing light is because light bleaches the cis-retinol into trans-retinol. And when that happens, the two dissociate, and when they dissociate, there's an energetic exchange, and that leads to a visual signal being transmitted to your brain. Okay? The bleaching of rhodopsin leads to a message occurring in your occipital lobe of the brain uh, telling you that you see something. Yeah, that's perfect. Yeah, I really think that's good enough. Uh, the idea is that um, cis-retinol is bleached to become trans-retinol. That's done by light. And then that trans-retinol gets enzymatically converted back into cis-retinol, which rebinds to opsin. And this process is almost instantaneous. So it just keeps circling, sending messages to your brain that this is occurring as long as there's light in the system. Um, and this is also how we activate and deactivate the rods and cones. So the idea is that the rod cells and bright light, there's so much light coming in that the rods, they can't keep up with the process. So you end up with all of the opsin just bleached out in the rods in bright sunlight. So they stop sending messages and only the cones will function. By comparison, in dark light, there's not enough light to bleach the opsin uh, the cis-retinol and opsin. There's not enough light to bleach the rhodopsin away uh, on the cones in dark light. So the cones just don't even perceive light because they only function when there's lots of light coming in. So uh, this is how we can turn on and off these rods and cones. It's kind of a long story. 
Let's not worry about this. It's a little deeper. All right, we will talk about light adaptation versus dark adaptation. So uh, light adaptation, uh, what's happening here is we've got, well, let's just run through it. If you walk out into bright sunlight, if you're in a dark room, you walk out into bright sunlight, you can expect your pupils to constrict. That's pretty obvious. You can expect your color vision to be kind of crappy for a short period of time, but then this bleaching process begins to catch up. You shut down the rods, you activate the cones, and uh, then you'll have good bright sunlight in just a few minutes. Okay, this is a very fast process. And uh, the rod vision is basically shut down because the enzymes can't keep up with the bleaching. Yeah, so uh, the idea is that light adaptation is a pretty short-term thing. You can have your eyes go and become ready for seeing bright colors and bright light very quickly. Whereas dark adaptation takes time. Dark adaptation can go on for hours and hours. What you have to do is you have to dilute the pupils, which happens relatively quick. Uh, you have to take all the bleached out uh, pigment from the rods and cones and reconvert that back into rhodopsin, all right, to get everything back functioning the way it's supposed to function, especially in the rods. Yeah, so this will go pretty quick. First couple of minutes, there's a lot that happens, but it can go on for hours, man. It can really go on for hours, and you realize this. You've laid down to go to sleep at night, and you can't see anything at all. You wake up in the middle of the night, and you look around, and you can see perfectly well. That's because it takes a long time for this process to occur. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. And let's see here. There's tapetum lucidum. So just for interest's sake, tapetum lucidum is a lining found on many nocturnal animals' eyes. Uh, tapetum lucidum is this shiny back coating that gives them better night vision. You can see this in any nocturnally active predator, like my little wolfy dog here and this cat here. Uh, the idea, again, being that this allows them to take advantage of all the light that comes into the eye, leading them to have very, very sharp night vision by comparison to animals like us who have darkly pigmented choroids, which make our night vision pretty crappy by comparison. So your dog has terrible vision during the day, that's why they smell around, uh, but at night their vision is almost the same as it is during the day, so they have decent night vision. You have terrible night vision, your vision is set, uh, specifically set up to be incredibly sharp during the day. Okay, that's perfect. That's perfect. Alright, so next is going to be hearing equilibrium. Uh, yeah, let's see how many slides we've got. Yeah, you can be expecting that to pop up at some time in the relatively near future. All right. Thanks.